Good evening from New York. Having seen the big money corruption that has nearly strangled our politics, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a five to four decision today, eliminated the nearly and sanctified the corruption. It ruled that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money to directly sway federal elections. When, in the shadowy confines of a parking garage, the informant nicknamed Deep Throat told Washington Post reporter Bob Woodward to follow the money, he was urging him to track the financing of burglars who'd broken into the Democratic Party's National Committee offices at the Watergate complex. The political money was, in total, a couple of million dollars. What was unleashed today could easily be billions. Later in this news hour, my special comment on the opening of Pandora's box by the Supreme Court. We begin with the latest details. The court today overturning two earlier decisions and throwing out parts of a law that has been on the books for 63 years, which said that companies and unions can be prohibited from using money from their general treasuries to produce and run their own campaign ads. Writing for the majority, Justice Kennedy declaring the restrictions censorship, saying that without today's ruling, Congress could also ban corporations from publishing political books or from posting their opinions on the Internet or from releasing films like Hillary the Movie, the Clinton-bashing, self-proclaimed documentary at the heart of the case. Last year, the Federal Election Commission having blocked it from television, but the court saying today that a Hollywood movie like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington could also be banned. The four dissenting justices today warning that individual voters will be drowned out by corporate cash, as opposed to being up to their necks in water in the current health care reform debate. The president today siding with the dissent, saying in a statement, quote, with its ruling today, the Supreme Court has given a green light to a new stampede of special interest money in our politics. It is a major victory for big oil, Wall Street banks, health insurance companies, and the other powerful interests that marshal their power every day in Washington to drown out the voices of everyday Americans. This ruling gives the special interests and their lobbyists even more power in Washington, while undermining the influence of average Americans who make small contributions to support their preferred candidates. That's why I am instructing my administration to get to work immediately with Congress on this issue. We're going to talk with bipartisan congressional leaders to develop a forceful response to this decision. The public interest requires nothing less. Other Democrats, like Senator Feingold of the landmark McCain-Feingold campaign finance law, calling the decision a terrible mistake and telling me today it was a Supreme Court run amok. Senator Schumer already worried about the electoral process now. Robber barons can act like parasites striking at the very roots of our democracy. At a time when Americans are worried about too much influence, this opens the floodgates and allows special interest money to overflow our elections and undermine our democracy. Meanwhile, Republicans like Senate Minority Leader McConnell reacting to today's decision as if it were the Emancipation Proclamation instead of Dred Scott and the corporations were the slaves. For too long, some in this country have been deprived of full participation in the political process. This wasn't Freedom's Watch that just won. It was Exxon Mobil. The Republicans not alone in hailing it as a First Amendment victory. I think the Supreme Court decisions today uh, are a big win for the First Amendment and, uh, and, and a step in the right direction. Well, let the American people uh, decide uh, how much money is enough. Sunshine really does work if you allow it to. The man with the artificial tan is telling us about sunshine. Time now to call in Jonathan Turley, constitutional law expert, law professor at George Washington University. John, good evening. Hi, Keith. Obviously, this, uh, whatever the long-term effects are, the effects before the case was, was adjudicated by the court, split the free speech community. Many believe it will lead to bad government. Others say there's no other way to rule on this. Where do you come down on the decision? Well, I have to tell you, I find this one of the most difficult cases that I've seen in my academic career. I, I ultimately go with the First Amendment and with the free speechers on this. And this is really, as you noted, divided uh, the liberal community. Many free speech advocates supported the conservatives in this case, uh, and many good government advocates went and supported the regulation. I've never seen a split uh, like this. And it is a very close question. Uh, but for those of us who put greater emphasis on the the free speech aspects, uh, we don't like the line drawing. We don't like drawing a line between Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 film and Hillary the movie. Uh, we, we feel uncomfortable when the, when the government plays that type of role. Uh, but I think you're right. I mean, let's not delude ourselves. This is going to open up the floodgates. This is going to have a very, in my view, deleterious effect upon our politics. The Constitution doesn't protect us from bad politics or bad choices. 
And so, you know, there is a movement to amend the Constitution, which I'm not thrilled with, but there are other things that can be done. What can be done? I mean, legally, what now holds the corporations back from completely taking over the electoral process? 99.9% .9 of advertising, 99.9% uh, .9 of winning politicians, no limit to the ante and no limit to what they want to do, including eliminating the First Amendment, if that was one of their goals for some reason. Well, I think you're right to be alarmed. I mean, there's only about 2,000 PACs that were created under the old system. That old system really has been shredded today. Uh, there are millions of companies and corporations that could, uh, could now directly support this political system. But I have to tell you, I have long argued that we are in need of some more fundamental reforms. That if, if Campaign finance primarily looks at the fuel rather than the machine itself. I think that we have a political failure in this country, a monopoly by two parties that is strangling the life out of this republic. And I think that we need to, perhaps with this decision, look for something of a paradigm shift, to look at how we can change our political system with very fundamental issues to deal with. Everything from the Electoral College, which is a disaster, uh, to the monopoly of the two parties, to the hold of incumbents. We can change the system uh, in other ways beyond campaign financing. I have to tell you, I don't hold a lot of hope for President Obama's suggestion that they try to deal with this legislatively. I don't see a lot of room here for legislative maneuvering uh, by this opinion. This is uh, the, perhaps the climax of the decisions in a long line of them giving corporations the rights normally afforded to individuals uh, since you would have, however, reluctantly voted with the majority. Is the issue here ultimately that, uh, that Santa Clara County case from the 19th century? The, the, is the flaw here the definition of a corporation as a person? Well, you know, this is part of the thing that, that is very difficult to, uh, to address because there is one view that corporations and unions and other organizations are, are the collection of people. The reason you join a union is so that you can speak with one voice to have more power than uh, you would as an individual. And unions are benefited in the same way as corporations here. Uh, and so there is that model. What's really fascinating about the, the opinions of Justice Kennedy and Justice Stevens is they're both very compelling. I mean, they're, they're, if you read them, it is, it is hard not to be convinced. But what you have emerging from these opinions, there's two starkly different views of the First Amendment. Kennedy is no corporate shill. I mean, he's, he is not, I mean, he really believes in this. If you've ta I've talked with him and mm. many people have talked with him. He does believe in the First Amendment aspects of this. And for him, it is all about criminalizing speech. It's all about limiting speech. Whereas Stevens has a different view, that speech really does not not guarantee that you can never distinguish between who the speakers are. It's two very different models of two people of, of good faith disagreeing. Constitutional law expert Jonathan Turley of George Washington University, as always, great thanks. Let's hope we can legally talk again in the future. <laughs> thanks, Keith.